Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation to the Eclipse Foundation. I just want to say a couple of words to my journey to give you the context of what I'm going to talk about. So I've been starting a PhD program in 2017 at the Technical University of Munich, and I was given the opportunity to work on really great projects and fun projects. So what we did is we have been automating full-scale race cars with various companies. This has been serving as a basis for our autonomous vehicle research and has, at the end of 2021, led to the foundation of DriveBlocks, which is a company which I founded with a couple of ex-colleagues from the Technical University of Munich, trying to build an autonomous driving toolbox with algorithms for object detection, motion planning and control. So, let's talk a little bit about the journey. We've been starting in 2018 working with the company RoboRace at the Berlin Formula E circuit. We have been automating this vehicle, which was the DevBoard uh, 1.0, and what we did there was we did several high-speed trials at the Berlin Formula E track. We achieved around 150 kph there, um, managed to do that within four to five months of development work, which was kind of an impressive task back at that time, and also, yeah, has laid the groundwork for what we did afterwards. So next step, a year later, um, at the Monte Blanco circuit in Spain and in Modena in Italy, we've been um, working with the overhauled vehicle architecture, which was called the DevPoint two, uh, the DevBot 2.0. And what we did there was extending the single vehicle races to multi-vehicle races. So it was kind of what was called a passing zone-based two-vehicle overtakes. So kind of like the um, yeah the leading vehicle was told that the vehicle behind it would get a chance to overtake, and then those two vehicles coordinated using a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication to do a safe overtaking. But um, as we see, uh, autonomous racing is dangerous, similar as to what human racing is. So if you're pushing the limits, things can go wrong and you can easily end up crashing a yeah, kind of a million dollar car into a tire barrier. So also these things happened and I think that showcased how complex also, yeah, this autonomous um, driving part is. But at the same time, I think, and that's always has been the reason why we as a university have been participating in these competitions, um, that racing is a good framework to test those things at the limit. Because if things go wrong, nothing, yeah, nothing actually bad happens. You burn money, but uh, no one gets harmed. And yeah, you just repair those things and move on. So that was a learning for me. Uh, back at that day, it was like you're like super yeah, uh, sad and you're like super overwhelmed with what happened. But for racing people, that's like their day-to-day -day work. Real drivers crash cars all day long on racetracks. So everyone was like, yeah, we just, you know, bring in the broken parts and replace them and we go again tomorrow. So that was kind of a good experience. Um, basically, in 2020, as all of us know, the pandemic hit, which also brought that project a little bit to a stall. Um, but we moved on, and in September 2021, we entered the Indy Autonomous Challenge, where we actually started to work on real overtaking, including vehicle perception. So what we did there is uh, we automated those Indy Lights cars. The chassis is capable of going 270 kph. Uh, we have been testing that with nine other university teams uh, preparing for a multi-vehicle competition. But in October 2021, so the first competition of the Indy Autonomous Challenge was held at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That was cut down to a single vehicle competition um, due to like yeah a couple of issues which have been there with like cars, vehicle developments, and these kind of things. But the final multi-vehicle competition was then done in January 2021 at CES as th at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. This has been a real head-to-head -head racing competition. The car hasn't had any information via V2X or other communication between the cars. So everything was done using camera, lighter perception, real-time processing on board of the car and speeds up to seven, uh, 270 kph. I'm going to show a video of that now. Um, probably the tech guys up there can up the volume a little bit to give you the impression of what it has been like at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Here comes Poly Move cranking up the speed, approaching 170, making the pass at 167 miles per hour. Toom starting to crank up the speed, accelerating to 160 now, 165 down the front straightaway. <laughs> And Toom Autonomous Motorsport completes that challenge. We move to the next tier of 150 miles per hour. 
Two. Two maintains that 150 mile per hour speed. Polymove accelerating to the outside, 168 through the corners, nearly to 169. Now they crack 169, accelerating oh. onto the front stretch and a spin from Tomb down to the infield and able to continue on. No damage to the car, but what does that mean for Tomb? Yeah, sure. I think. Probably just to give you a small insight to what actually happened. So the car had kind of a misperception coming from a radar reflection on the bank turns, which led to the car thinking that there was a vehicle in front, initiating like quite a strong correction maneuver, which eventually led at there to that spin. So just to give you the perspective on those ovals, it doesn't look very fast. They, they have been running 270 kph at that point. So it has been quite serious and uh, it has been a quite express, uh, impressive experience. I can just invite every one of you. So they're going to run again this year at CES. It's an official CES event, so if you go to CES, you will be able to go there. It's all included in the tickets, and it's going to be, I think, a very yeah, fun event. So giving you a little bit of technical insight as well, so what we did there is basically the stack consisted of sensors uh, covering GPS, LiDAR, camera, and radar sensors. All of those were fed into two kinds of perception stacks, one was, uh, which was a localization stack based on GPS and LiDAR, and there were three object detection stacks um, running on LiDAR, uh, like a LiDAR deep learning pipeline, a LiDAR clustering, so a classical algorithm, and a camera deep learning pipeline. And this was all combined eventually also with the radar data and an object tracking and prediction module. All of those modules have been self-developed by our team. Um, they have been fed into what we call the planning and decision-making algorithm, which was consisting of a local trajectory planning algorithm and a safety assessment, which was kind of like verifying that what the complex algorithm does is actually correct and could intervene if that algorithm has a failure. Finally, this goes into uh, our control stack, which was based on a model predictive controller and a sensor fusion state estimation to provide accurate information on vehicle velocity and uh, accelerations. So, what has all of that to do with open source? The first thing I want to mention here, most of those modules are available open source, or are going to be made available open source in the next couple of months. So this is something the research lab committed to um, like a year ago, roughly, um, that we believe that all of this should be made available uh, to other researchers, to other labs um, who want to enter the same competitions and follow that path. You can find more information on the links, uh, but I think if you Google that, it's also going to be shown up quite easily. The second thing is it was all built on a ton of yeah, popular open source projects. So the first here to name is um, obviously it was all run on ROS. So we used ROS2 Galactic, uh, which is a framework for application development for uh, robotic systems and for visualization of, yeah, uh, of yeah, measurement data, sensor data, and these kind of things. Related to the Eclipse Foundation as well, um, we, uh, we were based on Eclipse Cyclone DDS, which is a communication framework between distributed nodes in robotic systems, and all of that was deployed in containers um, based on the Docker technology. So for us, all of this was a great starting point to actually focus on doing the algorithm research rather than building infrastructure to make all of this possible. So, um, going a little bit or looking a little bit forward, what we want to do at DriveBlocks, taking those learnings from there, um, like I want to mention two things here. Our vision is to build a highly modular toolbox with autonomous driving algorithms rather than a black box predefined autonomy solution. So it's going to be much more of like a package-based approach where like vehicle OEMs, sensor manufacturers can pull out those algorithms and integrate that easily with their own hardware products. One of the technological differences is that we want to achieve scalability via a mapless approach, so we do not use high-definition maps or other pre-mapping technologies to roll out this kind of autonomy applications into the various um, yeah, applications we are targeting. So that's mining, container terminals, and highway on the road for commercial vehicles. Again, what has all of this to do with open source? Um, we believe that with all the experience we made uh, in the research that there is a lot of value, uh, especially yeah, in building these ecosystems of various players working together. And from, from our perspective, open source is one of the great tools to actually achieve this kind of collaboration. So 
we hope that in the future, as we have been seeing earlier in the presentations today, kind of a software-defined vehicle approach where like tier ones, OEMs, startups, and research institutes can, can collaborate on making um, yeah, autonomous driving a reality and actually advance the technology and make it safe. How to build this ecosystem? Um, I think there are a couple of things uh, which I want to mention in the next minute. So seeing what we have done so far, um, having the experience in working with the research lab, but also in the startup environment. I think, um, yeah, I just want to mention a couple of thoughts here on how we could proceed to achieve all of this together. So I think really a key is to find the right balance between ensuring alignment between different projects and design freedom in the architecture. We see on the right side here that it's a hugely complex system. So the autonomy stack is, um, is uh, consisting out of things like perception, sensor fusion, decision making, but it also contains things like the middleware, the operating system, data management, over the air updates, um, yeah, the connection to the cloud, and all of those hardware systems. So it's an intensely complex system and so I have found so far that an approach where we try to yeah, define everything up front is probably very likely to fail because it's yeah, just impossible to define all of this now and we have to yeah, achieve a working model where we can evolve together. So what I believe what we should do is we should embrace individually managed projects um, which can then collaborate and build a framework that they can work together. And the second thing is we should focus on small steps to achieve yeah, or to enhance the autonomy capabilities step by step. How to maintain it is also probably an important part we have to talk about. Um, everyone here knows, I think, that autonomous driving is one of the most complex technological challenges we are facing today, and it's also one of the most expensive we are trying to solve. So building viable business models around open source is definitely a key component in making this ecosystem work. So what we see is that open core and customization seems to be the most promising models there. It's Another concern uh, we see a lot when talking uh, with OEMs and um, peers in the, uh, in the community is that future standardizations and certification efforts should include open source as kind of a, or address open source concerns and discuss how these things can be brought into production because that's one of the main reasons currently vendors tend to yeah, go to proprietary solutions because there's no real process and no general yeah, agreed upon understanding of how this can yeah, get into, real, uh, into safety critical products in the autonomous vehicle industry. Finally, um, I think it's important to understand the dynamics of those two aspects and find ways to, yeah, for meaningful engagement between the companies and the uh, contributors from, the, from research and other companies. And finally, that brings to my last point, I also think that if we manage to build this ecosystem, we can actually bring uh, research in autonomous vehicles and building cl uh, commercial products closer together, which is kind of, I think, uh, going to be an enabler to actually bring the innovation we need to this kind of technology. All right, so to sum it up, I think um, what's in for you? Uh, we see that using open source technologies to build autonomous vehicles has a couple of benefits. So that is, it does, uh, it does reduce integration effort as soon as multiple smaller specialized players in the field start to work together because everyone already has like kind of a common understanding of how the technology works. It does allow us to bring research into production must, much faster. So looking back like five years, the software tool chains which were used in research for autonomous for automotive software development and the tool chains which were used in companies have been vastly different. And I think if we manage to bring those two worlds closer together, it's going to actually enable us to foster innovation in the autonomous vehicle space rather than having to redevelop software again and again and again. And eventually, I think it also helps um, to onboard new people in companies because they are already used to the tools. It makes it easier for people to yeah, um, get into the processes, and that's why, yeah, or which is another advantage of using open source technologies in the autonomous vehicle development. All right, that's it from, from my side. Um, I'm here for the rest of the day. I would be happy to discuss with you um, what are your thoughts on how to build this, and yeah, just reach out. Thank you very much.